It's the 30th of September 1963, exactly 60 years ago today, a very young 18-year-old Björn Ulvaeus entered the stage with the newly christened Hootenanny Singers. By that time, and in subsequent years, even the Swedish music scene was gradually colored by the British pop invasion and rock bands. However, the Hootenanny Singers kept up the tradition of Swedish folk music and became massively successful. In this episode, we will learn just how important they were for Björn as an artist and individual, but especially for a group called ABBA. I am thrilled to finally, on this channel, talk about and celebrate the legacy of the Hootenanny Singers. Hey, so, as a young teenager, Björn had a great interest in poetry and writing poems as well as playing music, all kind of genres as long as he could play music. Already early on, he developed a passion for creating musical arrangements, developing the structure of songs and layers of harmony parts. Two people were very important for setting the foundation for Björn to actually enter the music business. His best friend, Tony Root, got the chance to be in a skiffle band, but he would only do it under one condition, if his friend Björn was to join as well. And so, both of them became part of a group that would evolve into the Hootenanny Singers. The second important person was Björn's mother. She actually encouraged them to take part in a radio contest. The loyalty of Björn's friend Tony Root and the encouragement of his mother eventually brought Björn to that stage. The newly christened Hootenanny singers performed the beautiful folk song 500 Miles, 60 years ago today. A hundred miles, a hundred miles, a hundred miles, a hundred miles, you can hear the whistle blow, a hundred miles. Around that time, they were finally signed for a record deal at a newly established music label. That label was called Polar Music and the Hootenanny Singers became their very first act. Björn and his friends actually had the chance to be with the RCA label, but they were attracted to Pola and their manager Stig Andersson for two reasons. The label was small, making it focus on the group, and they felt that Stig Andersson was approachable. He even visited the boys before to talk about the business and encouraged them. We really believe in you, were his words. Their first single reached the top ten. Their folk music and the image of nice boys was an important contrast to the invasion of the Beatles and the craze of pop music. The Hootenanny singers became one of the most successful groups in Sweden and the Nordic countries. In their first year, 1964, they played more than 150 concerts, as they would every year, filled with radio and TV appearances, and they even participated in their first feature film comedy. That my hands was cold. In subsequent years, the Hootenanny singers had many big hits, but more intriguingly, their studio albums got more intricate and more ambitious. They would even develop their sound with orchestral arrangements and celebrate traditional Swedish poets and composers. Their fourth studio album in 1965 became their first record to contain own compositions written by Björn. No time and time to move along are, in my opinion, amazing folk rock songs. There is also a German version of Time to Move Along, Nimm dein Banjo dir zur Hand, and I get goosebumps when, on those songs, the harmonies open up, singing about existential themes. A subsequent composition, Baby, Those Are the Rules, became the Hootenanny singer's biggest pop hit and reached number two. Today, Björn is celebrated for his lyrics, but on many of these early compositions, he composed the music, and listening to those pure compositions prove that he was a marvelous composer of music. Björn not only became more and more ambitious as a songwriter, but as co-producer already on their next album. By that time, there was also a strong creative bond of unity within the Hootenanny singers. That bond would peak on their album from 1973. With all this experience, it is fascinating 
how their path crossed with three other individual artists from Sweden who would later come together with Björn as one of the best loved groups in pop history, ABBA. On that fateful stage appearance 60 years ago, another ambitious 17-year-old singer took part in the contest. Her name was Annifried Lyngstad and she even shared the stage with Björn at the end of the show when prizes and flowers were given. They don't remember to have seen each other yet. A few years later, a young Anja Tafelskog was in the audience on one of the Hutenenny singers' concerts. She laid eyes on Björn, as did all of her girlfriends. This is the single that Agneta asked Björn to send her as a signed copy, which he happily did. Sometime later, Björn listened to the radio and suddenly heard a beautiful female voice. He fell in love with it without knowing that it was that girl from the concert, one of his fans, Agneta Felskog. Even more crucial for the artistic evolution and success of ABBA were other factors in the story of the Hutenenny singers. They were only really successful in the Nordic countries, but Sig Andersson always tried to break through and had great ambitions to make it international with the Hutenenny singers. All those many lessons learned, the experience, especially within the European market, paid off a decade later with ABBA. It's also important to remember that the foundation of polar music was the success of the Hutenenny singers and many of their albums during the late 60s were engineered by none other than Michael Bitretov, that ingenious record producer who would later nail the sound of ABBA. But above all, the work with the Hutenenny singers eventually brought Björn together with Benny Anderson when they crossed paths during a concert tour. Benny, with his rock band The Hapstars, was ironically always keen on playing folk music. Björn, who played folk music with his band, was always keen on pop. So it seemed to be the perfect match. If we take a look at the one and only solo album of Björn and Benny from 1970, it has this beautiful blend of folk and pop. The Hootenanny Singers released 16 studio albums, the final two in 1979 and 1982, both without Björn. Over the years, there were some beautiful reunion moments. In 1989, on a television show, in 2005 for a stage performance, and at some point with a snowy landscape in the background. Johann Karlberg had died in 1992, Hans Schwarz in 2013. Today, the only surviving member of the Hutenenny singers next to Björn is his loyal childhood friend, Tony Root. In 2013, they actually got together on stage for a beautiful mini-concert in tribute to the Hutenenny singers and Hansi Schwarz. This was also the first time since ABBA's final concert in 1980 that Björn did a full-on live concert on stage and it was amazing to see him back singing folk songs and playing the guitar. Last summer, Björn and Tony were together again in their hometown Vestervik, where they were honored with a plaque for the Hootenanny singers. Tony Root will celebrate his 80th birthday this year in November. A few years ago, all of their albums were finally made available on digital platforms, even though many were actually never released on CD. On YouTube, you will find some official uploads of beautiful treasures of vintage TV performances. A brand new 15-minute program from Holland in 1965 was uploaded on the official YouTube channel Top Pop and a Swedish half-hour special from 1966 is available on the great channel Inomadi 100. I think it is long overdue for a comprehensive CD box set bringing together all of their music and honoring the legacy of the Hootenanny singers. In my opinion, there is an incredible magic in their harmonies and pure musicality. We can only hope for that CD box set or even a comprehensive book at some point, documenting the story of the Hootenanny singers. For now, I hope you enjoyed this video, a general overview celebrating 60 years of the Hootenanny singers. Let me know your memories or even favorite albums and songs in the comments below. Alright, until then, hello!